You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Happy New Year, Will. Happy New Year, David. And Happy New Year to you, dear listener. Yay! This is Common Descent Podcast, episode 25. Mm Mm-hmm. This is the final episode for the year 2017, although most people will be listening to it in the year 2018. In the future. In the future. Hello from the past. (laughs) Just like like everyone saying hello. We've come to warn you. (laughs) (laughs) Don't come back. Don't come back. It's terrible. (laughs) It's better where you are. Today, we are talking about a very exciting, uh, well, exciting, maybe a little depressing. It's, it's, a, it's always a mixture with these. <laughs> with, with talk of extinctions. As we've said, mo- much of paleontology, the best paleontology is based on really horrible tragedies of the past. <laughs> <laughs> it sure is. But before we get to that, a reminder here at the end of 2017 that... A lot of our work is supported by patronage from our patrons on Patreon. More than we could have wished up at this point. Absolutely. And if you are a patron, one of the potential rewards you can get is having your name shouted out on the podcast direct to you. So in the spirit of that, a shout out to one of our newest patrons, Nick. Welcome, Nick. Nick Robert on Patreon, who is also uh, tweets at us and Facebook comments and emails. Yeah. This guy's a big fan. Yeah. And we are a big fan of him. We are. Welcome, Nick. Thanks for for all of it. That, that's Thank been really you awesome. Much. This is a patron who stood up to a Tyrannosaurus for us. Yeah. <laughs> that's he a faced fan. Down. He faced <laughs> down not just any Tyrannosaurus, but the biggest one that the he could find. The biggest Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> So, on to today's episode. Will, you remember how way early on Mm -hmm. we did an episode about the end Cretaceous mass extinction? I sure do. The extinction that ended the age of dinosaurs. Yes. And it just so happened to be episode five. Yeah, it just worked out that way. And then after that episode, we got a request from a couple of listeners who wanted to hear us do an episode about the end Triassic mass extinction. Mm Mm-hmm. That kicked off the age of dinosaurs. Yep. And by sheer coincidence, it happened to be exactly 10 episodes later. Yes, it did. On episode 15. Yep. Just worked out that way. It was coincidence. Well, it occurs to me that two episodes is coincidence, but three episodes is tradition. It is indeed. Dear listeners, we are back after another 10 episodes to talk about another mass extinction and we are going to make this a thing. The most depressing tradition we could think of. <laughs> <laughs> episodes that end in the number five. Yes. Will be extinction episodes from here until we decide not to do that anymore. Yep. <laughs> until there's nothing left to go extinct. So yes, until we have covered, until everything is extinct. <laughs> until the final extinction. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, we've got a little bit of time. Uh, yeah, well. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah, I mean, literally a little bit. <laughs> a little. <laughs> <laughs> so today, you know, after we decided to do this episode, we went to the request list to see if an extinction had been requested, and one other extinction event had been requested, For and it was the Pleistocene megafaunal extinction. Which is a good one. This is the extinction at the end of the Ice Age that took out most of the famous big animals Mm -hmm. on land at the time. This suggestion came to us from Ian via Gmail. Now, if if you've been listening to the podcast, (laughs) you might (laughs) notice this... um... Ian is a very common name. Yeah, so... (laughs) (laughs) We came up with the idea for the Slots episode, and then we came up with the idea to do the extinction, and then we went to the list. It was like, all right, well, there's only one extinction on the request list, mm-hmm. so let's do that. And then after we had planned both these out, we looked at the list and went, hmm, same guy made those requests. Yep, yep. Good taste. So a guy with good taste. We have accidentally <laughs> done 
two back-to-back requests from the same person. <laughs> so congratulations to Ian. Apparently you're our favorite. Yep. That's subconsciously. We didn't realize it until we crunched the numbers, but yeah. From now on, we're going to try not to do that. <laughs> but for now, it, it has worked out that way. But at least they're going to be good episodes, so. <laughs> yes, these are going to be very good. So thank you, Ian, for both of your suggestions. Indeed. We are excited to talk about them. But first, the news. So, for my first news article, I would like to talk about the first bird. What? Yes, I thought that was fitting. So, there's a recent news article about Archaeopteryx. Woo! What, like, the most famous fossil? Which is, yeah, it is by far one of the most famous fossils. Now, everyone, many people recognize this one because it is still the oldest known confirmed bird fossil. Mm -hmm. There's been some other feathered individuals that may fall in that category that I think are a little older, but this one still holds the title. Yes, officially. Yes. (laughs) And this study is very interesting because it looked at one of the specimens of Archaeopteryx. There's only about a dozen Mm -hmm. that have been found to date and actually came to the conclusion that it was not. That it was not Archaeopteryx. Ooh. It was an imposter. Scandal. But it's cool. It actually led to some interesting results. So, this study is published in uh, BMC Evolutionary Biology by Christian uh, Foth et al. And they looked at not just any specimen of Archaeopteryx, but the first specimen that was initially misidentified as uh, Pterodactylus. Yeah, it's it's funny. It's the first one that was discovered. Yeah. But it wasn't identified as Archaeopteryx until later. Until over a hundred years later. So the first, but not the holotype. So not the one the, the group was described by. Yes. Which already makes it unique. This is mm-hmm. this it's had a bit of an interesting history, but they examined it and came to the conclusion that it is still theropod dinosaurs, so it's still small predatory dinosaur like Archaeopteryx, but not actually Archaeopteryx. Ooh. Which is interesting. So to give a bit of background, Archaeopteryx is found... The, Ar- the Archaeopteryx specimens have been found in the Solenhofen Archipelago in South Germany. Mm-hmm. And it's very fine sediment that preserves them very well. And this specimen was found not too far away from what would eventually be the holotype. Archaeopteryx is about 150 million years old. Just to give you some background on what we're looking at. And you know it's famous for being the transition from non-avian theropod dinosaurs to avian dinosaurs. Yeah. This, the... Harlem, but with two A's, fossil. <laughs> it wasn't discovered in <laughs> uptown Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. Different Harlem. <laughs> Netherlands. This specimen they looked at and found that it is still a small feathered theropod dinosaur, but slightly older from the from a group known as the Anchiornithids, mm-hmm. which are little feathered dinosaurs, feathers on all four limbs, non-flying, yeah. so not actually avian. Right, but close. But close. The interesting thing here is that before this, these dinosaurs had only been found in Eastern Asia. Oh, interesting. All of their specimens were known from there. This is the, it was discovered a while back, but this is the first one, uh, or this is the only the second of the species for this one that has been found from the Jurassic outside of that area. Interesting. So this is a group of mm-hmm. near bird yes. dinosaurs. Very, very similar to birds, but not quite birds. Exactly. In fact, Anchiornis means near bird. Yep. It's a good name. But new species, different location than mm-hmm. usual. So it was it's an interesting thing. Uh it led them to make some cool observations. Suggests that the group that would give rise to birds originated in East Asia from mm-hmm. the other fossil records. They began to move westward toward uh, Europe, and this one probably would have been one of the first to have reached Europe, one of the earliest ones. Interesting. Yeah, and it also, because of where the fossils was found in comparison to the other, the the actual Archaeopteryx specimens, is probably due to the fact that it could not fly and they could. Uh, Okay, so they were occupying... They were occupying new areas that it could not reach. Very interesting. And one of the uh, people who worked on the re- the paper was quoted saying basically that 
the other archaeopteryx should also be re-examined because, as I said, not every bird-like fossil that turns up in fine-grained limestones around Solenhofen need necessarily be a specimen of archaeopteryx. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really interesting point mm -hmm. because archaeopteryx, it has that sort of the curse of fame that it was the original almost bird dinosaur exactly. or earliest bird dinosaur. But the reality is there was a whole radiation of mm -hmm. early birds plus not quite birds, but things that if you looked at them, you'd be hard pressed to notice that they're not quite birds. Yeah. And as we've learned more and more about them, we've discovered more of that diversity. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this is the same thing that happens with lots of groups where when a closer look is, I mean, that's happened with modern crocodilians, even modern animals. Oh, yeah. When we look and go, you know, I actually think there's three crocodiles <laughs> living in this area yeah. of Africa. We just assumed they were all Nile, but not really. Yeah. And it's complacency can plague even the best of fields and people. <laughs> when yeah. you get used to an idea, it's very easy to overlook things that you might have otherwise noticed that would point out something interesting. Very true. Which I is like cool. this is a this is an interesting one because I was not familiar with the story of this archaeopteryx specimen mm -hmm. that it's it's been renamed a couple times yeah it's it's had a very inch it's it's one of those things where these fossils are famous because they're first bird but then this one also has like a rock star history to it where it's yeah. getting re-identified it was the first one it got misidentified misidentified again now we find out <laughs> and it's it's really interesting and that rock star history also includes who has worked on it. And it, because it's a new species and a new genus, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it has a new name. Yes. And it's named Ostromia mm -hmm. after John Ostrom. Yeah. And we talked about John Ostrom back in episode 23 as one of the major figures that kicked off the dinosaur renaissance. Yes. Around the end of the 60s, yeah. the 1960s. It's pretty and he's cool. the one that re-identified it as archaeopteryx. Yeah, he was what recognized it as a theropod. Yes. And put it in the, the correct grouping. Yes. Yeah, these yeah. these studies are always cool because on the one hand, I feel like sometimes it's tempting to to look at these and think and, and focus on the mistake. Exactly. That, oh, someone made a mistake and we've corrected it. But for me, these are always really cool because we just improved our understanding. Yes. Is yes, there was a mistake made and we've improved it and you could focus on that. The second half of that phrase, we improve. We yeah, we got something it. new. Now we are better, and it's you know, it's a lot of people who may get heartburn with sciences <laughs> like this will often point to moments of this, like well, yeah, but you had that wrong for decades. You know, what else do you might you have wrong? Well, <laughs> hopefully we'll find out. Yeah, we're sure going to find out. <laughs> <laughs> we're keeping an eye out. <laughs> yeah, we're this, like of course, but everything, everything has that. You know, we still are figuring yeah. out what diet we should eat. <laughs> that, won't, that won't make us sick or eventually give us heart disease. So, I mean, there's tons of things that we're still learning about. This is no different. Yeah, getting better every day. Absolutely. Moving on down the timeline a little bit, a little bit younger, we are going to settle at about 100 million years old, a new study that comes not of a dinosaur fossil, but a creature on a dinosaur fossil. <gasps> One of the most iconic images that came out of Jurassic Park, the movie, mm -hmm. was the image of the mosquito in amber. Right? Top of John Hammond's cane. Right on the top of the cane. And the whole idea there, obviously, was that it sucked the blood of the dinosaurs and then yeah. pulled the blood out and cloned the dinosaurs. And there's a lot to be picked on about the idea that, all right, yeah, we can't actually do that. Yeah. You can't get DNA from that old. But another... Lesser known criticism of that, not really a criticism, but issue, cor you know, comparison with real life, we've never actually found a blood sucking parasite associated with a dinosaur fossil. Yeah. We've never actually had evidence of a particular blood sucker feeding on dinosaurs until now. Woohoo! So, so now we can. Now. Well, now yeah, we yeah, can, now yeah. we can resurrect dinosaurs. Yes, Obviously, yes. all the barriers are There gone. we go. This is. <laughs> what we've been waiting for. Uh, more on that in a second. <laughs> this is a study by Enrique Peñalver et al. in Nature Communications, who discovered several ticks preserved in Burmese amber. One of these ticks is discovered 
still clutching onto a feather. Which is really, really neat. Now, as you know, dear listeners, there's only one group of animals that has feathers, mm -hmm. and that's dinosaurs. Yeah. Now, at this time, this is a pinaceous feather, or something very much like it, and so there's a lot of different groups of dinosaurs that had those. Mm -hmm. This could be something Velociraptor-like. This could be Oviraptor-like. It could also be an early bird. Mm -hmm. That's unclear. So this was either on a bird or on a not-too-distant-from-bird type of dinosaur. But this is the first time we've ever found a blood-sucking parasite on a remain of the body of a dinosaur, which is very interesting. Yeah, it's d direct evidence. Yes, and in addition to this, there were a bunch of other pieces of amber that preserved four other ticks, and these were not found with dinosaurs directly, but they were found with a few other interesting points. Two of them were preserved side by side. Mm-hmm which suggests that they were perhaps congregating somewhere. Yep. One of them was full of blood, which That's suggests cool. that it had recently eaten, and all of them were associated with the tiny little remains of dermestid beetles. Oh, interesting. And dermestid beetles eat skin, fur, and feathers. Yeah. And there's no fur known from Burmese amber, but there's tons of feathers. Mm -hmm. And dermestid beetles today like to hang out in nests. Mm -hmm. All together, this evidence suggests that A, at least that first species of tick was clutching onto a dinosaur, and these others were most likely hanging around in the same place as the beetles that feed on feathers, perhaps being dinosaur nests. Very cool. Altogether, the most likely explanation for all of this evidence is that these were ticks that were hanging around dinosaurs, probably parasitizing them. Mm -hmm. The original tick, the one that was actually with the feather, is a known species called Cornupalpatum bermanicum. The others belong to a new species that is called Dinocroton, which means terrible tick. <laughs> and the species name is Draculi. <laughs> <laughs> Well done. <laughs> nice. A couple of implications here. First of all, no DNA. Yep. Okay. DNA doesn't last that long. Sorry, it, everybody. It just doesn't. But this could give us some new insight or new places to look for evidence of diseases mm -hmm. and the ecology of both the ticks and the dinosaurs they were feeding on and yeah. the evolution of the ticks and the dinosaurs they were feeding on. Lots of interesting questions to ask from here. Yeah, dinosaur parasitology. Yes, which is super cool. That's really, really awesome. This is neat because, like you said, not many people either bring up or seem to know that we don't have evidence you know, before this of dinosaur feeding parasites. Yeah, blood sucking, certainly. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, exactly. I didn't know that until this came out either. And it's one of those where it would be weird to think otherwise because every animal has parasites oh yeah so of course dinosaurs did too and even though that makes complete sense and you've seen in documentaries walking with dinosaurs had them plagued mm -hmm. by parasites and jurassic park they use it but still you can't take that as a you can't use that as a reference until you actually find something yeah and it's Here that's it a weird thing of like you know it must have been happening but we don't mm -hmm. have it, so we can't talk about it. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> we don't have any evidence of it. We have no, can't make any yeah. inferences. And this is a cool, so this is a, a opening, literally a, a brand new door that we hadn't been, we knew was very likely there, but now we can open it. Yes. Also, I wrote an article about this, and I spoke with Dr. Amanda Falk, who is not part of this study, but I asked her for some commentary on it. She studies bird evolution. Oh, cool. Uh, she is also one of the hosts of Paleo After Dark, if you're interested in other paleo podcasts. She made the point, she made a lot of points, but one of the points that I like that she wrote up that I didn't think about was that a lot of birds today have behaviors specifically to ward off parasites, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like dust bathing, yeah. or they'll hang around things like ants, yeah. because the ants ward off the predators, or like um, owls, screech owls famously will bring blind snakes into their nests. Yeah. Because the blind snakes eat the nest parasites. Yep, yep. Which is fascinating to wonder what kind of behaviors dinosaurs would have had 
to ward off their own parasites. Yeah, you can now picture a little theropod in a puddle of water on on the ground, bathing itself like you see birds do, to yeah. wash its feathers clean. Yes, so many cool questions mm-hmm. to ask now. It's cool. It's this is a really exciting you know, for for something as small as it is. It's very exciting. Yes, it is. Sweet. Well, my next one is about big animals. So some of them are about big animals. There's also <laughs> some small animals in the study as well. But that's okay. This is about even younger. We are now talking about mammals and or age of mammals. This is about the Tibetan Plateau and its effect on animals evolution and vice versa on how we learned about the plateau. Very interesting. The Tibetan Plateau is the raised area where Tibet is. Absolutely. Adjacent to the Himalayas. It's a raised area of land. Yeah, some of the highest places in the world. It's called the rooftop of the world. Yeah, but it wasn't always there. It was not. So like most geological features, it raised. It actually lifted up. Mm -hmm. And geologists have been studying it to figure out when it rose and what exactly caused it. Mm -hmm. And they've gotten dates before. This study was a new attempt to bring in those dates to a more refined answer Mm -hmm. using a not typically followed source for geology, and it's to look at the animals. Neat. So instead of looking directly at the rock, they decided to look at the animals of that area going back 30 million years which Mm -hmm. would encompass, they know that the plateau formed somewhere in that time, Yeah. and look at how do the distributions and features of the animals change, and what clues would that give them on the state of and formation of the plateau. Fascinating. Which is, it's really, really awesome. So they looked at the a wide variety of animals. They did both new analysis and used old research. Mm -hmm. And basically this is a culmination. So this is a a research paper that's bringing together many, many previous researches and, or studies and new ones as well. Yeah. And who did this? This is Deng Tao. And he actually uh, presented this at the American Geophysical Union fall meeting uh, in New Orleans, which is where my family's from, or (laughs) half of it. They looked at this and found some cool stuff. So they looked at a number of animals: big ones, elef- shovel tufted elephants, big horned sheep, woolly rhinos, the the ancestral relatives of things like uh, snow leopards and Arctic fox. Okay. And also some small ones, rodents and fish. Uh, climbing mm-hmm. perch was one that they looked Interesting. at. Interesting. Yeah. So wide, wide variety of animals, and they found a very interesting progression that leads to a timeline for the plateau. So the date, farthest date they go back to is the Oligocene, 34 Mm -hmm. million years ago. And at that time, the distribution, especially of the large animals, was reaching from China to India, meaning they were freely migrating across the area that would have been Tibet. Right, right, right. So there was no barrier. Exactly. They were reaching both north and south of what would nowadays be Tibet, and meaning that they, they were able to move over the land, as mm-hmm. they get into the Miocene, starting about 23 million years ago, mm-hmm. at the mid-Miocene, they stop seeing certain animals, shovel tusk elephants, they stop seeing that south of the plateau area. So they're, they're up north, but they're no longer exactly. showing up down south. So something has stopped that migration that was pre- previously happening. Ah. So they this this would for this study, be the markings of the beginning of that elevation, that that increase in elevation. Right. And alongside that, as they get to a little bit later into the uh, Pliocene, now Mm -hmm. we're just about 5 million years ago, animals north and south are are separated, and animals in the plateau area start showing signs of adaptation for freezing environments, and the smaller animals by this time have disappeared in that area. Uh, this was just before the Pleistocene. They start seeing the smaller animals that would have, were adapted for the lowland are no longer found where the plateau is today. So as it starts to push up, they start dying off in that area, and the bigger animals start to adapt to the cold. So they've got Oligocene mm-hmm. with standard distribution across yep. the region. By the Miocene, big animals are no longer traversing the region, 
presumably because the plateau exactly. has risen high enough to stop them. Mm -hmm. And we see the smiles start to die off there as well. And by the Pliocene, you see the evidence of animals on the plateau have to adapt to the much higher elevations like we see today. Which have much colder temperatures. And they also made the point that one of the things that's interesting about them adapting to the cold is with the upcoming ice ages, mm -hmm. the plateau would have had to uplift it at least a few million years before the beginning of the glaciation for them to be cold adapted to serve, you know, to, to persist right, through right, that. Right. So interesting. Those two things or the, that those series of things lead them to this rough timeline, which lines up with isotope studies beforehand and Very cool. gives them a new look at the timing of the plateau. Geologists using fossils to infer geological activity is not unusual, mm -mm. and we talked in episode 22, Micropaleontology, about how we do that, mm -hmm. but it's not nearly as common for it to happen with big animal fossils. Mm -hmm. That is a very interesting proxy to use to say we can, in, we can look at the geological processes by looking at the effects it was having mm -hmm. on the animals of the region. Absolutely, and, it, and they said that it supports the theory that had been going up, up to now that this uplifting was caused by the in collision of the Indian and Eurasian subcontinents. Right, the continental right, right. plates crashing into each other that have been about 40 to 50 million years ago that they started hitting each other. Right. And it pushed up that landmass. Now, they do say this. not all the evidence lines up with this because some isotope analysis of two fossils in the Himalayan region show that those animals were, during the time of the Miocene, show that they were grazing on C4 grasses, which there are categories of vegetation, and this was a category that grew in warmer weather. Interesting. So it's not, there's still some conflict there's there. There's still some you know, a disagreement with the evidence, but the researchers said they think the addition of more fossils will refine mm -hmm. the edges of the view on this and bring in a clearer picture. I look forward to seeing that. I absolutely do. <laughs> As it progresses. This is a cool, cool thing with really cool implications for where else they could use this kind of technique. Yeah. It's neat. Very good stuff. Yes. The final news piece, the youngest of the news pieces, yeah, takes us to the Pliocene. Working through the timeline very nicely. Yeah, that worked out really nicely <laughs> today. This is a study of a bear with cavities from the Pliocene. Fire. These are fossils from Ellesmere Island, which is in the high Arctic of Canada, mm -hmm. from the Pliocene about three and a half million years ago. A warmer time, but it was still the high Arctic, still a chilly place. Mm -hmm. S remains of two individuals of a species of bear called Ursus abstrusus that give us evidence from their teeth of how the bears made it through the cold winter. Ooh. Ooh, intrigue. This is a study by Xiaoming Wang et al. in Scientific Reports. These are fossils that were excavated since the 1990s. They found bits of skull and skeleton. Ultimately, the remains of two different bears, an adult, a young adult and an older one, mm -hmm. both a little smaller than modern-day black bears, and, as I mentioned, both with cavities in their teeth. Same kind of cavities that we get, you know, to go to the dentist. I was say, I sympathize, bears. Yes. And what's interesting is that it's rare to see cavities in wild animals, but modern-day black bears get them very commonly. Oh. And the reason that they get them, and the same reason that we get them, is by eating sweet things. Mm -hmm. In the case of modern-day black bears, they get them when they eat lots and lots of fruit. Yeah in preparation for hibernation, to fatten up for hibernating. Lots of natural sugars. So this evidence, these bears with cavities on their teeth, lead the researchers to suspect these might have been doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. They might have been getting cavities when they were eating lots of sweet fruits to fatten up for the winter. And the fossil site where they're found has plant fossil evidence for all sorts of different berries. All right. Raspberries, blueberries, lingonberries. So they were possibly eating those berries 
possibly for the same reason that bears do today. Mm -hmm. They eat a lot of them to get fattened up for the winter, which in the polar regions is not only cold, but dark. Yeah, absolutely. This is interesting because it might indicate a time. It gives us an an idea of when in bear evolution they started doing this. Mm Mm-hmm or at the very least this lineage, or they started doing it in this region, we can get an idea of what, you know, when did this behavior of fattening up on fruit mm-hmm. for the winter hibernation get started in bears. Very interesting. So, yeah, it's when we talked about the, the first article being one of those things where it could be easy for people to take away or focus on the wrong aspect of it. It'd be very easy to look at this and be like, so we found out old bears were doing what bears do now. Like <laughs> bears yeah. were being bear, which yes, we are finding out they're doing the same thing. But that's still interesting because oh, yeah. once again, even if you would assume that bears probably bulked up and hibernated very similar to bears living in cold environments today, until you find evidence for it, just because yep. it makes sense doesn't mean it's how <laughs> it is. And like you said, this can lead to when did this behavior develop? You know. And Absolutely. Down it's the like line. a tick. Yeah, exactly. Now we know for sure, and we can ask all sorts of new questions about it. Now we can actually ask questions that beforehand we just had to conjecture on and go, it would make sense that they did that. Yeah. You know? I, we don't, we haven't seen a, any evidence that they didn't do that yet, so that would make sense. Mm-hmm. But it's st- right at this point, it's still just something that makes sense. Now it actually is something that probably happened. Yes. Yeah, so we've got early birds, dinosaur parasites plateau evolution and bears with cavities hungry hungry bears hungry hungry bears very neat but today's episode topic is yet younger oh. than all of those news articles see see how that worked out everybody nice see how we totally planned that it was nice straight path it's <laughs> really it's what professionalism looks like Dabs- oh yeah we are 25 <laughs> episodes in we figured out how to do this thing <laughs> Today's episode focuses on an event that occurred within the last 50,000 years. This is an event called the Pleistocene Megafaunal Extinction. And it is called that because it occurred at the end of the Pleistocene Epoch. Mm -hmm. And it mostly affected megafauna, which is a word that means big animals. Big animals. This is the latest prehistoric mass extinction. Yeah. This is an extinction event that has shaped the modern world directly. This is one that we got, actually got to experience. Yes. <laughs> and and maybe more. Yeah. So let's start by discussing what, what the Pleistocene was like. Mm-hmm. So the Pleistocene epoch started around two and a half million years ago. Mm-hmm. And the Pleistocene is... A lot of the time, it's very convenient to simply call the Pleistocene the Ice Age. Yeah, definitely gets summed up. When you think of the Ice Age, this is the epoch you're thinking of. Mm-hmm. The cl- Even though it's not 100% accurate, and here's why. The climate of the Pleistocene is characterized by cycles. Yes. Of cold and warm, cold and warm. It was all, it was all cold, right? We live in a cold time period on Earth. Right. But you had periods that are glacial periods or glacial intervals yeah. where ice expanded and then you have interglacial intervals where the ice retreated and things were a little warmer. Yeah, so there were periods of time where large areas froze and mm-hmm. then periods of time where those areas were able to melt and it yes. went back and forth. So during these glacial periods, you had advancing ice that create, you know, glaciers but also continental ice sheets that covered huge chunks of northern North America Mm -hmm. and Europe and Asia, similar to what we have in Antarctica today. Exactly. During these times, you also had lower sea level Mm -hmm. because all that water was caught up in the ice. Had to come from somewhere. The land dropped downward under the weight (laughs) of all that ice in the northern (laughs) continents. It's insane. And then when the interglacial intervals came up, when the the, the ice would retreat, the sea levels would rise, the land would rebound. This is something called isostatic rebound. (laughs) Just, yep, like breathing. 
you'd also get a lot of glacial lakes and other freshwater formations as the ice water melted. Mm -hmm. And as you went back and forth between these glacial interglacial periods, you would also see changes to weather patterns, to ocean circulation, to habitat distribution, Mm -hmm. right? How different species were living, where plants were living. In some cases, it was as simple as they move north, they move south, they move north, they move south. Other places, not so simple. As to the cause of these cycles, well, I won't go too much into this because this is this whole episode, yeah. but they're tied to what are called the Milankovitch cycles, mm-hmm. in part, which is changing rela- you know, orbital cycles that change how the Earth's relationship to the sun changes regularly over time. Yeah, uh, The global temperatures are also closely tied to carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. Yeah. As CO2 rose and fell, temperatures rose and fell. Yeah, it was it was multiple aspects working together that would cause yes. these changes. So this was a dynamic time. Yeah, and it's it's important I think cuz typically the ice age gets portrayed as and then things got cold. Yes. For a long time. And that's as we just said not what happened, but it's it always gets portrayed as, and then everything froze. Yep. And for some reason, it stopped <laughs> being frozen. <laughs> That's a really good point. And it always makes me think of the line in the movie Ice Age, mm-hmm. where the two mammals are talking. And yep. the one guy goes, I'm just saying, how do you know it's an Ice Age? <laughs> it's because <laughs> yeah. of all the ice. <laughs> yep. But the Ice Age, you know, people think of Ice Age as the perpetual winter, mm-hmm. which is not what it was. Yeah, it's not Game of Thrones. No, it was it was cold, right? Mm-hmm. It, globally, it was colder during glacial periods, but there was still summer. Yeah, this still got warm in the summer. It was still warm on the equator. Uh, the interglacials were pretty much like today. Today is an interglacial. Yeah, we are. We have come out of a glacial interval. We are now in an interglacial. Whether or not we're going to go back to yeah, a glacial, yeah, well, I don't know. We're doing our damnedest. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing our best. But you know, half the ice age, to t- you know more or less half of the Pleistocene was like right now. Mm-hmm. And these intervals lasted typically about several thousand years at a time, glacial, interglacial. Mm-hmm. During this time, ecosystems, the life on the planet, was very much like today. Yeah. It, 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 was, it was very similar to today. You'd recognize just about everything with the exception of a few things. One, lots of extinct species. Yeah. Especially... Big ones. Yeah. The Ice Age fauna included such impressive mammals as mammoths, mm-hmm. mastodons, woolly rhinos, ground sloths. Yeah. As we talked about last episode. Gl- the armored glyptodons, the longhorn bison, the Irish elk, oh, those are so- uh, giant marsupials in Australia, lots of saber toothed cats, giant short faced bears, dire wolves. Uh, big birds, too. The moas, the the elephant birds of Madagascar. Mm-hmm. There were also s- numerous species of human. Yes. Homo sapiens was around for much of this time. Uh, the Neanderthals, the Denisovans. The other difference was that life was distributed differently. A lot of animals that you would recognize, but were in unusual places. There was yes. a North American lion, for example. A North American yep. cheetah. Horses and camels in North America, hyenas and lions and elephants and rhinos in Europe and Asia, in places where we don't see them today. Yeah. So life was familiar, but things were moved around a bit, and there were a lot more species. Yes. Particularly of big things that we don't see today. Yeah, we think today of the elephants, and you can literally name them on one hand. Yes. They were crazy diverse. And everywhere. All over the place. There were also entire biomes that don't exist anymore. Yeah. There were steppe ecosystems, which were these, in a lot of cases, northern grassland ecosystems that had lots of diverse animal life, lots of diverse vegetation, big grazing animals that that sort of were keystone species Mm -hmm. to maintain those environments. Hunted by large predators, these sort of sprawling ecosystems, the most famous of which are the mammoth steppe. Yeah. Ecosystems that used to go, you know, across Siberia and places like that. These are ecosystems that don't exist anymore. Yeah. That is entire biome that was unique to that time period. 
to give you a sense, just because I, I love explaining this, the latest glacial period, the end of the Pleistocene, around the Pleistocene ended around 12,000 years ago. <laughs> the peak of the last glacial period was around 18 to 20,000 years ago. During that time, the global climate was about four or five degrees Celsius, cooler than today. Mm -hmm. Ice sheets sat on top of where modern-day Chicago and Boston and other northern cities are multiple miles high. <laughs> and sea level was about 400 feet lower. 400 feet <laughs> lower than today. Yeah. So, similar world to today, but especially during glacial periods, some pretty significant differences. Yeah, like, from from an aerial view, you wouldn't be able to recognize the shape of North America in many ways, because it, half of it's under ice, and... And half of it's exposed out of the water <laughs> that you wouldn't see today, yeah. <laughs> Your shorelines have grown. This is, and that's always my answer whenever people say, talk about modern-day global warming. And they say, oh, what's, what's, what's one or two degrees difference going to make? Like, well, the last four degrees of difference <laughs> was uh, several hundred feet of sea level and miles worth of ice yes. on top of Boston. Yes. The math has been done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there, there's, uh, there's some, some changes that might be coming our way. And then there was the extinction. Bum, bum, bum. At the end of the Pleistocene, we see the loss of lots and lots of species, especially big mammals. Mm -hmm. There is evidence for the extinctions, you know, smaller level extinctions happening earlier, you know, back to a million years or so. But the main bulk of the extinctions happened within the last 50,000 years, and especially around that very end of the Pleistocene 10 to 12,000 years ago. Uh, especially in North America, that was a very significant time for these extinctions. So coming into the end of the, the, the epoch, and that's not a coincidence, right? Just like the Cretaceous and the Triassic, the, it ends when the extinction happens because we've named it that way. Exactly. That's, it was what was significant that we could notice. Yep. And it predominantly affected megafauna. Mm -hmm. There's not really a hard definition for what megafauna is, yes. but you'll commonly hear it referred to as animals, terrestrial animals that weigh a hundred pounds or more. Yeah, right. Big animals that deer, humans are megafauna, yeah. horses and moose and wolves and all sorts of animals that are basically just big ones. And we've mentioned this before, but we tend to forget that we're a pretty big animal. Yes, we are. Like, we really... Because to us, we're normal-sized. Right. <laughs> but for primate, we're really big. Yeah. And even, like, most mammals you see, you know, most animals you just see around you are usually smaller than us. Like... Oh, yeah, usually way smaller. Way smaller. Like, so we tend to forget that, you know, because everything else is, like, that's grass level it gets kind of lumped into... Tiny yep. things, <laughs> but there's more of them yeah. than there are of us <laughs> by a long shot. Now, during the end of the Pleistocene, right, in the late Pleistocene, there were some some three or four hundred species of prominent megafauna across all the continents. And at the during the end Pleistocene extinction, we lose about half of them. Wow. About 50% of that diversity, especially in North and South America. Yeah. And also in Australia, we see it everywhere, but the Americas got hit very hard. Europe gets hit pretty hard. We especially see it happen with a subgroup of megafauna called mega herbivores. Yeah. Mega herbivores is another one that, that the definition of mega herbivores is elusive. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the times I'll read it described as things that weigh essentially one ton or more, mm -hmm. but they're not. That doesn't always include all the one ton or more animals Yeah. when people talk about megafauna or mega herbivores. So we're looking at things like elephants, yeah. rhinos, giant ground sloths, glyptodons. The, the, the Ice Age had really big camels and really big bison mm -hmm. and things like the liptoterns and diprotodon down in Australia. Yep. These multi-ton 
herbivorous mammals that were by far the biggest things on the landscape. Exactly. Yeah, and it's a lot of the things that you think of like farm life, you know, and up. You know, mm-hmm. Big, yeah. big grazing animals moving in. A lot of times, big herds. Yes, uh, and that's why it's weird the the d- to define them as one ton. Yeah, which I've seen is weird because cows fit in that, and yeah. horses and giraffes definitely fit in there. But but the people don't usually talk about them as mega herbivores. It's so it's always is... tricky when you, especially with size category because yep. when it comes to animal sizes, you like to categorize it like well there's you know mouse and deer and cow and an <laughs> elephant but like yeah. there's a gradient like there are different sized cows going from small to big cow and there's yeah. different sized <laughs> you know, even elephants have different so. It's a gradient. Yeah. Where do you draw your line is kind of arbitrary in a lot of yeah. senses. So you're never going to find that perfect. Yeah. So mega herbivores are really, I would say that you, I would classify them as herbivores that, number one, make you go, wow, that's big. <laughs> yes. And number two, have a very dramatic impact on their ecosystem. When elephants move in, you know it. Exactly. Everybody knows it. Yeah. During the late Pleistocene, there were somewhere in the vicinity of 40 to 60 species of mega herbivore animals on the planet. Today, we have about 10. Yeah. We've got a few elephant species. We've got a few rhinos. We've got one hippo. <laughs> yeah. If you count giraffes, which again, for some reason, I've never seen anyone... I, I don't read giraffes described as mega herbivores yeah, they, for some I, reason very much. because they're skinny, I guess. But they're in there. Yeah. But yeah, we're at under a dozen from what used to be only 20 to 50,000 years ago, four or five dozen species of huge, huge herbivores. The extinction also takes out a lot of the biggest carnivores. Mm -hmm. All the saber-toothed cats, uh, a lot of the biggest bears, the largest carnivore in Australia, Mm -hmm. the marsupial lion. So goes cool. extinct. We see these extinctions everywhere, right? Africa, we see it. Australia, we see it. But it is especially dramatic, again, in the Americas. Mm-hmm. The Americas lost just about all of the really big herbivores. Yeah. And just about all of the really big carnivores. Whereas, you know, Africa obviously still has elephants and rhinos yeah. and hippos. We do not have that here. Not it's, anymore. I, I use that comparison exactly when I I talk about you know, ancient North America. It, it and for a lot of countries, but for our continent, we very much looked like we picture Africa today. Yeah, we did. Big herbivores roaming around, large herds roaming the grasslands. You know, multiple big predators hunting them down. You know, in Africa. Yeah. That's what we picture Africa as, but it was it was also more so that it had, you know, as you said, it still had more variety that it lost, but we were that and almost went down to none of that. So it seems an alien thought, but yeah, yeah, we had twenty plus species of multi-ton mm-hmm. mammalian herbivores here in North America, absolutely through the late Pleistocene. This is also around the time that we lose other big animals like the birds. Mm-hmm. The moas and elephant birds a little later, uh, the titanus, oh. the big forest rakids from South America, the giant lizard megalania from Australia. This is the depressing part of the... <laughs> yeah. And then there's other animals that go extinct. There are smaller animal extinctions. There are ecosystems that disappear, mm-hmm. like the, the mammoth steppe and such. A brief note on why large animals go extinct in this time. And we'll talk more about causes here in a second, but it's always important to remember that large animals are typically a, an early casualty Mm -hmm. of extinction events. Yes. And the reason there's a couple of, of main reasons. The biggest one is that they need more resources. Absolutely. Big animal needs more food, needs more space. And when resources start to get limited, that, you're the first, you know, a mouse is going to do fine in scarce resource 
times compared to a rhino. Yeah, exactly. the mouse won't notice until it gets really crazy. But yeah. as soon as you start, you know, missing a meal a day as an elephant, you're you're feeling it. Yes. And big animals tend to have smaller populations mm-hmm. and tend to reproduce slowly and less offspring. Yeah. Slow gestation. You know, a mouse has a bunch of baby mice. Yeah. <laughs> it's just... An elephant does not have a litter. No. <laughs> An elephant has one baby. It takes two years to make it. Yep. And that's it. And, and a lot of times with big animals, it takes a long time to gestate. And then they, the female may not enter heat again right away. It may take a year yeah. off, you know, a summer abroad. And Yeah, well, I, I after a two-year oh, yeah. pregnancy, I oh, would yeah. take a break too. <laughs> and, but that's, and that's part of the issue people in conservation run with today is that to repopulate, you know, elephants in Africa, that's not a matter of just like, all right, we'll put them in a pen, let them make a bunch of babies. So, all right, you're going to be there for two decades. Yep. As they make a bunch of babies. <laughs> you know, we can breed alligators like nobody's business. That's the reason they bumped back since the 50s. Yeah. Because you ha- they lay 30 eggs, you incubate them, you have 30 alligators. <laughs> yep. Big, especially big mammals, they're slow. Yeah, and so when... They, they don't adapt quickly. Every number they lose, it takes a while to bounce back. Yep. There's also a bunch of side effects that come with losing large animals. Mm-hmm. So this extinction, you, you know, we always talk about, oh, you know, well, the species disappear. Yeah. But this extinction is really interesting because it allows us to get a firsthand look of what the world looks like when you lose things mm-hmm. like that. The most obvious answer is that, it, you know, Ask a third grader, yep. and they'll tell you that when you pull something out of a food web, yeah, right, you remove prey, the carnivores suffer. Yep. So there's clearly that, but there's also the really interesting effects that big herbivores, especially, have on vegetation. Mm-hmm. For one thing, big herbivores disperse plant seeds. Yep. Right. That's the whole point of a fruit is that it's tasty, so you eat it, you get cavities like yep. those bears. You eat it, you digest it, you walk somewhere and you poop out the seed and the plant is able to spread. Yep. There are plants today. These are the, these are sometimes referred to as megafaunal fruits. Yeah. These are plants like Osage oranges, honey locusts, avocados. Yep, yep. Which produce fruits and or seeds that are so big or so tough to eat that the animals in their natural environments typically don't eat them, Mm -hmm. which makes you wonder what those fruits are even doing there until you remember that there used to be animals that were adapted to eat these fruits. Yep. So now you've got a bunch of plants that aren't dispersing properly in the modern day world still because their pollinators, essentially their seed dispersers, have gone extinct very Uh, recently. I haven't seen Charlie in a while. Yeah, right. Has anyone seen any ground sloths? I was hoping to I made spread my nice offspring to the other of side avocados. of the hill. <laughs> <laughs> Big herbivores also control woody growth, right? Elephants tear yeah. down trees, and that helps to maintain grasslands. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we actually see across the end Pleistocene boundary, grasslands replaced with forests. Yes. And open forests replaced with denser forests. As the trees rebel. This can also affect fire, right? A forest that is full, uh, that has more vegetation. Old growth. And more of certain, more overgrowth, more woody vegetation, more grass, is more prone to fire. Yeah. And that can change how an ecosystem functions. Big herbivores also move nutrients around ecosystems a lot. Yeah, they disperse. Yeah, they, they'll eat foods, sometimes foods that other animals can't eat gather up all those nutrients, and then walk, you know, a day's walk for a herd of elephants Miles. is, yeah, outside the territory of most other animals. <laughs> so they're carrying nutrients all over the ecosystem, dropping them off the way that elephants do. Dropping. And now you've got new plant growth. Right? They're cycling all mm-hmm. of these resources around their ecosystem. And when you start to lose when you lose so many big herbivores those things stop happening yeah the world we live in today is depauperate yeah we have lost a lot of not only our biodiversity 
but the effects that that biodiversity had on our ecosystems. It's one of my one of my all time favorite terms because it sounds awesome. And it's for a very interesting thing, but trophic cascade. Yes, as you. As one change happens, it causes other changes, which therefore causes other changes. Yeah. Like a domino effect goes down. And it can work both directions, but it, and it can be good. You know, the famous one that you'll hear it with nowadays, if you were to look it up, will be the wolves going back to Yellowstone. Yep. And causing all these side effects just by how they're hunting. Yep. But it also works in this direction of take away something cool, a lot of other things can suffer. Or, at least change. Yeah. An ecosystem, Bob, is like a giant clock. <laughs> it only works if all the cogs mesh together. <laughs> so this brings us to the big question, of course, as is always the most interesting question, of what happened. Why? And uh, instead of speculating wildly, we look at what it coincides with. Mm-hmm. This extinction coincides with two major events that tend to be the two major events that get discussed. The shifting climate yeah. and the spread and population of Homo sapiens. Of a very violent and aggressive predator. A scary alien <laughs> from another ecosystem. Humans are a virus, Mr. Smith. Mr. Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> this is an example of an actual debate in paleontology. We've mm -hmm. talked before about how there's a lot of things that the news likes. Like, you'll see headlines that say, debate. Yeah. There aren't really a debate. Like, the whole T-Rex predator scavenger thing. It's confusing debate and discussion. Yes. This is a debate. Yes. There is a lot of back and forth on this. So, let's talk about the two biggest hypotheses, that climate change led the extinction and that humans killed everything, starting with the climate. So during this time frame, we were pulling out of the last glacial period, mm -hmm. especially toward the end of the Pleistocene, that sort of 20,000 to 10,000 years ago was a time we were getting warmer, but there was, you know, consistent climate change going back you know, back to 40, 50,000 years where these extinctions started to get rolling. Yeah. We see climate shifting across the world in ways that could be affecting the ecosystems. Mm -hmm. As temperatures change, you not only get warmer temperature, you get changes in seasonality. Yeah. Right? The lengths of your summer and winter, how warm the summer is, how cold the winter is. You can see changes to precipitation, increased rainfall, decreased rainfall, just like you get a more intense warm seasons versus cold seasons. Mm -hmm. You also can get more intense wet seasons versus dry seasons. Yeah. This affects how the water cycle changes, environments shift around uh, as, as ice advances and retreats, as sea levels rise and fall. These can be some pretty significant changes Absolutely. to environments around the but world. For, for anyone who's moved from north of the U.S. to south, you know how intolerable it can be. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And this can have a number of effects on the animals and plants living yeah. in these ecosystems. The most obvious is if it gets warmer and you're not adapted to the warm, you're going to struggle. Yeah. But it also can move and shrink habitats. Yeah, and divide and divide habitats, and as your natural environment waxes or wanes, if you're shrink, you know, you're running out of food, you're running out of space, you might have to migrate, but maybe you can't migrate for some reason. Mm -hmm. The seasonality is a really interesting one that I haven't thought much about in the past until I started reading up on this. That idea of if as the seasons are changing, that's going to throw a wrench into the nat natural cycles of plants and animals yeah. when it comes to things like reproduction and migration. Yeah, exactly. That if your reproductive cycle is offset from the seasonal cycle, that's a problem yeah. for you. If you're designed to have babies at a certain time of year so that you avoid a freeze, but then temperature things start getting warmer or cooler at a different time, your baby may be born at the worst time. Yeah, it can also affect, if, even if it doesn't affect you, it can affect your food. Yeah. 
plants blooming at the wrong time or yep. migration happening at the wrong time and you were trying to catch the the big tasty animals as they came in mm -hmm. all these cycles can be offset and that can really dramatically affect life and once you, there's so many little things like the the plants blooming was an interesting one because i immediately had the thought of if your plants bloom at a different time but the but your pollinators still pupate at their normal time yeah well, those plants don't get pollinated so yep. even if you're able to eat them, there's no plants next year. <laughs> yeah, so that, those weather and climate cycles can really be mm -hmm. a, a very, very important factor. There are a few major points of evidence to support the link between the climate shifting and the extinctions. Mm -hmm. The biggest one is just the timing. Yeah. And, and we see this a lot. The extinctions are happening at the times that climate is changing. Great change comes with lots of death. Yes. <laughs> and there's evidence of environmental change happening. There was a, a, a prominent study from earlier this year that looked at moisture. Mm -hmm. And this was specifically looking it, it, it one of the big findings of this study was how it was affecting Australian environments. Right, right, right. Looking at how moisture changes were affecting the distribution of the grasslands, the composition of the grasslands. Mm -hmm that you were changing your vegetation based on your precipitation, your water retention, things like that. And that moisture shift was associated with changing environments, which are happening around the same time that you're seeing these extinctions kicking off. Yeah. Another big supporting point for the idea of climate shifts causing extinction is that there's lots of precedent for it. Yeah. We have seen climate-related extinction in the past. And, and, you know, more recently. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that too. But there have uh, there are other ma major extinction events that line up well with climate changes and are generally agreed to be related to climate. Yeah, it's not a new concept. It's a pretty nope. tried and true method of causing extinction. And that stands out dramatically in contrast to the other suggestion of human-caused mm -hmm. extinction, the idea of a single species spreading across the globe and causing mass extinction does not have precedent. Yeah, it sounds like a sci-fi film. It does. Now, there are counters to the idea of climate-caused extinction. Mm -hmm. There are gaps that people point out. One of the big gaps is that the link in time and space isn't perfect. Yeah. There are plenty of examples where we've examined the fossil record and we say, well, the evidence for the climate change and the evidence for the extinctions don't quite match up. Yeah. And that's a little troubling. There's also the fact that the extinctions were greater in some places than others. Mm hmm That it, like we said, the Americas got hit hard, whereas Africa got hit less hard. Yeah. Think uh, There are a lot of examples of island populations that held on extra long. Yeah. And those differences aren't all accounted for in, in some of the climate suggestions that why, if it's a global climate shift, are we seeing dramatically different effects in different places? Yeah, why are they suffering at different amounts? Yep. And some of that, like that moisture study found that the the changes they were seeing related to moisture would affect different ecosystems differently. Yeah, is that it's, it's, it will hit the continent yep. in different spots differently. But probably the biggest argument, the most common argument that I've seen, and the one that kind of sticks in my head the most, mm -hmm. is there were lots of glacial interglacial cycles yes. through the Quaternary. There were a good two dozen of them. Yes, that's the big one. Why wasn't there a mass extinction every time? Yeah. What was special about this ex this this time period that made this climate shift particularly devastating. Yeah. That is harder to answer. Mm -hmm. One of the main suggestions is that what was different about this one wasn't the climate at all, but humans. Us. Us. Oh. So the other big suggestion, the other side of this big debate, is that it wasn't the climate changing that caused all of this extinction, but the influx of a new hyper-predator named Homo sapiens. Yep. Now, Homo sapiens wasn't new. Homo sapiens has been around two or 300,000 years. But what was happening at this time 
was that Homo sapiens were rapidly becoming more advanced mm -hmm. and rapidly spreading around the world. Yeah, we were on the move. Started in Africa, ended up in Asia pretty early on, but then started to spread. We made it to Europe, to Australia, to the Americas, and the big suggestion, sort of the classic suggestion, is what is called, very catchily, the overkill hypothesis. Yes. <laughs> which is exactly what it sounds like. Researchers said, hey, you know what humans are really good at? <laughs> Hunting things. Killing spree. Killing things. And, and one of the reasons that we're so good at that, one of the reasons that people really suspect that we have the ability to do this is that we are generalist hunters, Yeah. so we're not picky. We can hunt until we run out of mammoths and then yeah. move on to something else. And we're omnivorous, Yeah. which means that, you know, if the mammoths migrated away, we'll wait. <laughs> you know, we got, we'll eat plants, Yeah. and then when you come back, we'll get you again. It's, at the aquarium, one of the... It sounds like a really funny thing, but it's not a bad question. But one of the most common questions we get is, well, can you eat it? Just <laughs> looking at one of the it's animals. Like, <laughs> it's like the, what's the Explorers Club or whatever, yes, that yes. their whole thing was eating exotic animals yeah. from around the world. And we get we get that question a lot. And I get it, because when you're looking at a sea urchin, you go, I know it's an animal, and I know we eat animals, <laughs> but that, that's a pin cushion. But the answer, nine times out of ten, is, yeah, no, they, these are these are not only edible, but they are actively eaten somewhere. <laughs> yes, we like to eat. The weirdest things you would expect. There's not really that many animals on the list, of the entire list, that we have not turned into food at some point. Yes, and we're very good at it. Really are. There are lots of historical examples of us absolutely devastating populations by hunting them. Well, and because not only are we, do we have a generalist diet, an omnivorous, and now at this point are tool users who can adapt to hunting styles, we can also prepare food. Yep. You know, if you're a little too raw or a little too tough, oh, we cook you. Yes, which gives us a huge variety of what we can eat. Yeah. We'll figure yes. out how to make it edible. <laughs> yeah, if you're not edible, we'll make it yeah. edible. We eat, we my, my go-to example, we eat puffer fish. Well, yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> one of the most popular, like, culturally popular drinks, mm -hmm. uh, an entire genre of culturally significant drinks, the main ingredient is poison. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Way to go, humans. Just That's fantastic. <laughs> so, there is some really significant evidence mm -hmm. that leads people to link human hunting with the extinctions the most dramatic evidence and the most commonly cited evidence is very consistently when humans show up in a new environment, species disappear. The party ends. And this goes back, humans appear in Australia at about 45,000 years ago. Megafaunal extinctions in Australia kick off about 45,000 years ago. Yep. 30,000 years in Japan, 10 to 15,000 years in the Americas. Definitely on islands. <laughs> There's this almost immediate effect on a lot of like Pacific islands in Madagascar and New Zealand. Humans show up, species disappear. And now I'm going to make all of these species disappear. Yeah, <laughs> this is my magic trick. <laughs> Poof, they're all, they're gone. all gone. One of them. <laughs> well done. Feathers sticking out of your mouth. One of the other really intriguing bits of evidence, sort of supporting evidence, for this, particularly in contrast to the climate suggestion, one of the arguments I pointed out against the idea of climate-caused extinctions is that the intensity of extinction is different in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. People who support the human hunting hypothesis point out that the extinctions are the least intense in the places that humans were there first. Yeah. That a continent, Africa, the animals on Africa evolved alongside humans. Yes. Whereas North America, we are an invasive predator. Yep. And so this the idea that the farther you get from Africa, the worse the extinctions were is another notch that a lot that people who support the overkill hypothesis will point out. Yeah, look, that's fits in with our idea here. Yeah, it it, it the the maps line up. There's also we know humans hunted 
a lot of Ice Age animals. There's mm-hmm. evidence mm-hmm. of us hunting mammoths and things like that. This also accounts for why the extinctions in many cases were so rapid. Yeah. We show up, we wipe things out before they have a chance well, to adapt. We walked all the way over here, where we're hungry now. Yeah. <laughs> but, like I said, this is a debate. There's argument against this. Yes. One of the biggest arguments, once again, is the timing doesn't always line up. Mm-hmm. And especially as we are learning more about the timing of all these effects, we're finding that it doesn't line up as well as we thought it did in some places. Yeah. Another well-known case from of an Australian study recently, and I think we talked about this earlier this year, yeah, yeah. that there is newfound evidence that humans may have appeared in Australia as early as 65,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. And if that's true, that puts us there well before the extinction started. Yeah. Uh, there was also the study earlier this year of evidence of humans in North America way before we thought they were there. Yeah. So are we exact on the timing? We don't know. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of argument against it. And that the the early arrival raises the question of if we got there, why did we only start hunting things later if we were the cause? Like, yep. If we got there and started hunting right away, you know, it, you know, we weren't vegetarians when we got there and then decided to eat meat, so... Yeah, why the lag? Why the lag? Now, some people... It, it's funny, actually, because on the other hand, some people have argued that when the when the timing of human arrival and extinctions lines up very closely, that's actually evidence against hunting. We just come in swinging. Be, well, because it would take us a while to build up population. Mm-hmm. And to those people, finding evidence of humans a little earlier actually supports the overkill yeah. hypothesis because they're saying, okay, that's where the time was, that was the, for us to build up <laughs> our population. The uh, um, um, What's the the critical mass moment? Yes. Where we were finally big enough that we were having an effect on the environment. Yep. So trying to identify the timing of all these different things from what really is sparse evidence, it's the fossil record, can be very challenging. Just like the Cretaceous extinction. Yes, yes, trying yes. To, when exactly did the volcanism happen? When exactly did the extinctions mm-hmm. happen? When exactly did the asteroid hit? It's the paleontological equivalent of splitting hairs, trying to figure out exactly where yep. it falls on the line. It's, I love this one, though, because effectively the question they're asking is, okay, yes, but how quickly can humans start <laughs> to mass murder things? <laughs> Just how good are we yes. at murdering things? I mean, are we right out of the gate, or does it take, do we have to build up momentum? I mean, <laughs> let's run some tests. <laughs> And that's, uh, I will bring that argument up <laughs> in just a second. Uh, I, I want to mention that another ar- ev- point of argument against this idea is that there's actually not all that much evidence of us hunting all that many different Ice Age creatures. Yeah. There's evidence of mammoths, there's evidence of bison being hunted, but there's plenty of megafauna that there's no actual direct evidence that we hunted them. Yes, it would make we sense. We kind of presume we... that we show, yeah. we eat everything. Yeah. But we don't know, you know, ground sloths, glyptodonts, <laughs> that's a lot, you know, it's hard to know without that direct evidence. Mm-hmm. There's also the fact that lots of megafauna survived. Yeah. And if we're painting this picture of humans as just this <laughs> insatiable plague, <laughs> just killing and eating everything. L- locust with weapons. Yeah, well, it's like the um in the day the Earth stood still, the new one. Yeah. Sorry, everybody. Yeah, you know. Where the well, I guess they were like robots. Uh, oh yeah, um, or whatever they were that were just eating everything Gork? as they. Gork. Like, I'm pretty the... sure it's his name's Gorg. Someone out there is correcting me right now if I got it wrong. <laughs> that, Gorg's it, the listen, new robot. I'm not splitting hairs over the remake of the day the Earth stood still. Facto, <laughs> Baracto, <laughs> Nicto. Yeah, that's. <laughs> so you know why did some megafauna go by? relatively unscathed. Yeah, they tasted bad. <laughs> yeah, maybe. maybe, maybe they, we that See, that should be the test. See, this, That's the experiment. We need to... Back to the adventuring club, we need to taste test. And we need to taste test knows. extinct animals. Oh, yeah, no, the ones we don't have, what we have left of them, they, they taste good. I get it. <laughs> uh, there's also the, the arguments that in some places the, the extinctions are drawn out. In some places there are animals going extinct that you wouldn't expect to be affected by hunting. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of... You know, this is a... There's evidence to support it, but it's not perfect. Just like the climate shift, Mm -hmm. there's evidence to support it. It's not perfect. And that brings up some of the sort of 
other suggestions yeah. that are less commonly talked about, but are brought up, and I think there's some merit to some of these. Yeah, it's still valid to mention. One of the big things, and this was something that I have always wondered before I started really digging into this topic, is we focus on humans as hunters, but humans have a lot of impacts on the ecosystems around them. Yeah. One of the things we do, for example, in addition to hunting and killing things, is we kill other predators. Yes. This is another thing we have a historical precedent Mm -hmm. for doing. We are very keen on wiping out other dangerous animals. You're going to kill us. We're going to kill you. Yep. We could also potentially be out-competing other carnivores. Mm Mm-hmm. Right, it's not necessarily that we're hunting other animals to. Yeah, we didn't hunt saber tooths to extinction, for example, but we hunted their food and we pushed them away. Yeah, we were better at it. That perhaps that was an impact that humans may have had on their ecosystems. There's also the point, and you know, we think about humans transporting invasive species as a modern thing. <laughs> it's not. No, we've been doing that a long time. There are plants in some parts of the world that are so ingrained in ecosystems and have been for so long that researchers aren't sure if they're native or not. (laughs) Yeah. Because we've been doing this for tens of thousands of years. And when you bring invasive species, you can introduce competitors, Mm -hmm. right? If you're carrying domesticated dogs wherever you go, that could also be adversely affecting the other carnivores, Mm -hmm. right? There's precedent, you know, the thylacine, one of the reasons suggested for the recent extinction of the thylacine, the Tasmanian wolf, is that we brought dingoes in. Yep. And they outcompeted them. Domesticated cats are like the worst thing for small animals everywhere in the world. Oh, yeah. They're, 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 they're the, they are the horror slasher villain. Yeah. Of the animal (laughs) kingdom. Just, just murdering innocent little animals. (laughs) Yeah, and that's not to say nothing about plants. Yeah. Or insects that we carry from place to place. Yeah, when the, and half of those could be accidental. You know, if I'm just mm-hmm. carrying a bit of food I picked somewhere else and I drop some and it sprouts. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah, or if it's, you know, we're, we're especially later on in the Pleistocene, mm-hmm. if we're farming. If I, yeah, especially with farming. And we're bringing crops along with us and those cro- and the bugs that eat the crops are, are following us along. Or if we have parasites that that live on us, mm-hmm. that we, you know, we could be introducing all sorts of things to environments. We're like a little caravan. Yes, we're a little, little like clown car of who knows what. <laughs> See, I'm just picturing us like Pigpin from the Peanuts cartoon, just a little cloud <laughs> yeah. of dust and flies and domesticated animals and seeds just falling yeah. off of us as we walk by. There's also the point that. Humans, you know, we we talk about environmental, you know, we think about it like, oh, we, you know, we kill off animals and plants, but we also destroy trees and set forests on fire. Yeah, deforestation. You know, humans have been, you know, you think about fire. It's like, oh, yeah, we can use fire to cook, and that's Mm -hmm. great. Yeah, we can also use it to burn out the undergrowth so that we can move more easily through forests and find our prey more easily. That's something we've been doing for a long time. Well, and, you know, set, you know, things like setting up alongside streams and rivers and affecting mm-hmm. the flows or the contents of that by using it for either plant growth or just our needs. Yeah. You know, all that kind of stuff. Now, a lot of these are a little bit, t- you know, a lot of these, they suffer from the same lines of evidence or lines of lack of evidence yeah, yeah. as the idea of us hunting. One idea that has really taken off, and that is to say that it has a, at least a, a group of people who have championed this idea of one of the side effects of human spreading is disease. Yeah. And this is extremely common, you know, in plants. You know, there, tons of plants have been wiped out by diseases that we have accidentally brought over yeah. from other continents. Uh, but the, the 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 idea of a what's called the hyper disease hypothesis because <laughs> they have to have catchy names. <laughs> this is why everybody likes the human hunting one instead of the climate change one. Yeah, the climate change hypothesis doesn't have a catchy name. Right, exactly. You got it's all about uh, marketing. You gotta sell yourself. <laughs> you gotta call it like the oven effect. Right, it's, it's the day after yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> 
the core idea behind the hyper disease hypothesis is that either humans or something humans brought with them could have brought a new disease that jumped species. Mm -hmm. Right. This is like, and, and, and the, the, the two guys that are credited with really first championing this are from an AIDS research center. Oh, and that's what AIDS was. AIDS yep. was a monkey virus that jumped to humans. Yeah. Uh, it was like the bird flu, the whole thing with the bird yep. flu, where we were concerned that this that this bird virus was going to mutate in a way that would make it very virulent to humans. Yeah, it's, it's not common that things can jump between species, but it happens. Yeah. And it can be really bad when it does. <laughs> and you can get pandemics. like You know, right now, North America's bats are all dying because of a disease. Yeah. Amphibians everywhere are dying <laughs> in general because of a disease. And so these people have suggested, you know, maybe there was a disease effects going on mm -hmm. here. This is very hard to find evidence for. Yeah. Yeah. This is one of those it's an interesting idea that's really tough to show through fossil evidence. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to find evidence for populations dwindling via disease. We have to find animals mid-cough. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It was sneezing, and the yes. head was tilted back. You see like the dinosaurs. handkerchief here? It was about to sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh -huh. But you can look at tissues for evidence of pathogens. Mm -hmm. You can look at DNA genetics for, for population changes, and even perhaps, if it's viral, remnants of disease. So there's potential. Mm -hmm. It's been suggested. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other big suggestion... Which is that the climate or human activity that could have caused these extinctions was not as big an issue as the side effects of the extinctions once they started. Yeah. The idea that humans or climate only had to knock out a handful of the most important species. Mm-hmm. And then you got Will's trophic cascade. Yeah, you just knock out the support columns and a lot will come down with it. Yeah. All that stuff I mentioned before about how the modern day world suffers from the lack of the big, big herbivores. Mm -hmm. It has been suggested that those might not just be side effects. They could also have been factors in the extinction. Yeah. That the lack of nutrient cycling and the lack of food for certain carnivores mm -hmm. and the lack of control of woody, you know, as, as grassland gave way to forest, that that may have been just as big an impact on the animals trying to survive in those environments. And then you have that cascade, right? Yeah. We wiped out mammoths and then the ground sloths went extinct because they lost a lot of their resources. Yeah. Yeah. As grasslands appear and forests come in, Another animal loses its food. Predators mm -hmm. lose their food and you go down the line. Yup. One more suggestion that I want to throw out there, even though it is not a popular one. Mm -hmm. It's a very recent suggestion, and that is a, a there's a team of scientists who claim to have found evidence for an asteroid impact. Oh, interesting. Right at the end of the Pleistocene. I was actually at a meeting where they, they, they hosted a debate panel for this uh, many years ago. This is highly questionable Yeah, for lots of reasons, but it's been suggested. Lots of people don't like it. There's a lot of sort of, all right, find us more evidence mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To, to show that there even was an impact. Crater, it didn't happen. Right. And then to show that it would be a big enough deal yeah. to have done this. Like I said, I want to mention it because if you... Google search more information on the Pleistocene extinction, you will see this. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a recent suggestion, and it doesn't have a lot of traction, but hey, who knows? Yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, there's the point to be made that we spend so much time focusing on competing hypotheses that the headlines rarely mention the combined effect. Exactly. And that's something that, you know, when, when we argue over these things, much like the past extinctions we talked about, it's not so much was it this or this. Yeah. We know the climate was shifting. Yeah. We know humans were hunting animals. We know humans were affecting their environment. How much did each of these things play a part? Yeah. It's it's I mean it's the concept of like when you have a bad day because a a, a bunch of things you know you you your tire blew out and then you were late to work so you got chewed out and then 
you spilled coffee on your shirt. Well, which one of those made it a bad day? Mm -hmm. It was a bad day. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And that you know, and that comes up a lot with extinctions is mm -hmm. that question of if this thing was missing, would the extinction have happened? Yeah. Right. If it was just the changing climate and Homo sapiens wasn't on the scene, mm -hmm. would this have happened? Would yeah. it have happened, but less severely? Mm -hmm. On the other, if humans had spread during the last interglacial, would the extinction have happened back then yeah. instead of, you know, what or during, you know, an, an earlier time period or whatever exactly. your, your time frame is? Yeah, had we spread right after the change, would things have yes. had the same? Yeah, it's we, you know. When looking for answers in science, it is often easy to forget or overlook or not want to rely on the idea that coincidences can happen and do yeah. happen very, very often. And it's, 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 you know, there, there can be the idea that maybe when we have these mass extinctions, it's because all the wrong things lined up, you know? Yeah. And it just, you know, to use the, the, the cosmic coincidence, uh, just, the yeah. dice rolled the wrong way, and you had a climate change up oh, and people. Yes. Oh, uh, it's bad that you drew both of those at the same time, because that's gonna that's not gonna play out well for you. Yeah. You know, had one of them happen, you might have been fine. It's that happens, and that you know, it's the same. We find weird fossils sometimes that it's it's just coincidence that it that animal died that way, or that it died yeah. during that event. Well, and you're talking about you know things coinciding mm -hmm. sounds unlikely, but changes happen all the time Absolutely. and you're looking at hundreds of millions of years. Yes. Eventually, you know, the, the climate shifted back and forth during the Quaternary. What, you know, something different happened at the end of the Pleistocene. Yeah, it's, it's the idea of if you continue to roll like two six-sided dice over and over, eventually you will have a <laughs> moment where it counts up. Just, it'll go yeah. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And you'll be like, what? <laughs> if you roll in enough, eventually something weird's going to happen, and it's going to seem crazy, yeah. but it's just eventually the statistics work out a lot of the time to have these things line up just yeah. because of the numbers. Now, in science, we don't – you. it's very hard to target that. Exactly. Which is why our studies – right, a study is going to say we are trying to disprove the overkill hypothesis. Yes. We are saying we have evidence that suggests against the idea of human hunting causing these extinctions. Yeah. Or we have evidence that shows a link between the climate and these extinctions. And so that's what the studies do. Mm -hmm. But of course, the reality is there's links for both. Yeah. There's good evidence to think that both of those things had an effect. And that's why we're arguing about it. It's hard to detect chaos. Yes. <laughs> and so. <laughs> and. And this always makes me think of a conversation I had with a gentleman back at the museum in Tennessee. Somehow climate change came up, and he – this, this conversation started because he said that temperatures getting warmer is a good thing. The only time you see extinctions in Earth history is when temperatures get colder. Mm -hmm. And I immediately said that's not true at all. Mm -hmm. That is inaccurate because the end of the Pleistocene. As we came out of the glacial period, we saw a dramatic pulse of extinction. Yeah. And he – he was, oh, well, but that was humans, he argued. Yeah. And I made the point that, right, but why were humans doing so well? Yes. Right? That was also the time that we had come up with, with agriculture and the mm -hmm. agricultural revolution, which possibly couldn't have happened when everything was covered in ice. Yeah. And were we able to migrate to new places because the climate shifted? Because we're not traveling in brutal winters, but now... It's fairly warm summers. Yes. So these are not extricable from each it, other. Yes. You can't there there's no like yeah, the the fact that humans were able to do what they did was because of the climate. Yes. And maybe animals were vulnerable because of human activity, or maybe they were vulnerable because of a uh, uh, climate and then humans came in. They're all of this was happening, and, and our job is to figure out exactly, what, as much as possible, what did what, when and how and where and why. That's one of the um, tricky aspects of science in general, is that when we went over scientific method, eliminating variables is part of doing scientific research, so that you are only testing mm -hmm. one thing at a time, but the environment doesn't do that. Yes. Yeah. The environment <laughs> is... It's not a control. It is not a control. There. 
there are many variables and they're all having an effect. Mm -hmm. And so testing a single variable at a time can never give you the full picture. And yeah. it's sometimes easy to accidentally ignore variables while you're trying to reduce the amount of variables you're testing for. And it's the natural world is a complex, messy system. Yes. That does not lend itself to unraveling. <laughs> so it's... Yeah, it's tough. It's, so it's really hard to figure out which Jenga block it is that you know, caused it to become unstable. Yeah. Now, there is another very short note mm -hmm. to be made about the fact that these extinction, you know, normally we talk about an extinction event, yeah, the end Cretaceous, and we say, well, the extinction started around this time and they ended around this time and then everything recovered. There has not really been a recovery mm -mm. from that. We still live in a world, as I mentioned before, affected by the lack of these species. But even more than that, we never went back to the normal extinction rate. Yes. Over the last 10,000 years, extinction has continued at a relatively high rate and has, in recent times, gotten even higher. Yeah. We talked about how the timing, right, where humans showed up to different continents mm -hmm. may or may not line up with uh, the extinctions. Within the last several centuries... When humans go to islands, things go extinct. Yep. We have, you know, whether or not, however much we were involved at the end of the Pleistocene, we are definitely involved in the extinctions of continuing hundreds of species oh, over yeah. the last several thousand years. We're good at it. Hunting, environmental change, all sorts of different things that we do to our environments. And there is a question, there is a big question to be asked as to whether or not the modern-day extinction crisis is a different extinction. Yeah. From the Pleistocene... Was the Pleistocene megafaunal extinction just the first stage? Yeah. If we go into the future 66 million years, and we look at the geologic record, would we be able to tell the difference yeah. between the extinction of Australian megafauna 45,000 years ago the mammoths 10,000 years ago, and the giant panda today. Exactly. Would that even show up as different in the geologic record millions of years in the future? Yeah, are we, in, are we still in the midst of the end Pleistocene extinction? Yes, and, or is the end Pleistocene extinction simply the first stage yeah. of a, an extinction that will get a different name? <laughs> yes, yes. The extinction. The extinction. Yes, the, the final extinction. <laughs> the last one. The one, yeah, right? <laughs> That's what the aliens will call it. Now, that, you know, there, there has been a lot of discussion these days of what they're called, what, the, what, they, the, what has been dubbed the sixth extinction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? The sixth of the big five. The Pleistocene megafaunal extinction is not considered one of the big five. Yeah. But... The modern extinction crisis, people have suggested that this is the latest one that is big enough to stand alongside yeah. the end of the age of dinosaurs. That discussion, dear listeners, <laughs> is for another episode. Absolutely. A hundred percent. This is a interesting concept that I, I wanted to comment on because I think this hints at something that uh, often happens when we as a general society, think about prehistory, you know, mm -hmm. extinct animals, ancient life, fossil animals, we tend to see it as separate from current history. Yes. We see it as prehistory and then modern history. Once we started writing things down, and that's how it's talked about, is this is how things were, and then there's today. Yeah, we talked about things evolved. Yes. This is, you know, things evolved to today. Yeah, and that this is and yeah. it's very easy to subconsciously or very consciously reach the mentality that that means well, this is the end line, you know, that now human civilization right. you know, human civilization we know will change. We have all our sci-fi movies showing us eventually in space and on Mars and with yeah, flying cars. Giant coruscant style cities, but we still assume that it's like all right, now the the earth the earth reached us and that's that's the best it's going to do, and now it's done is kind of the thought that happens a lot of time. But it, the timeline is a continuous line, and we're still on it, and we're still moving forward on it. There's yeah. no bumper 
there's no you know little line that separates us from prehistory oh yeah those geologic divisions are arbitrary exactly that's we just decide this. when we were writing and beforehand we weren't yep so we're still in a geological time period and yep it will continue to go and eventually we will leave this geological time like this is not the last geological time period unless yeah. we blow up the <laughs> the whole planet the whole planet <laughs> but it's really easy to forget that those things didn't happen in some separate history that yes. is our history it is happening it is happening now we are now currently making history and that was just the older history yeah and so yeah it's we are still experiencing things that are the effects of things that happened in the past to quote one of my favorite campers that I had in my time as a camp teacher slash mm -hmm. counselor makes you think. <laughs> makes you think. <laughs> I'll tell that story on after chat. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Dear listeners, a couple things to, to follow this up on. Number one, there are lots of professionals with lots of very strong opinions about this topic. Yeah. There sometimes we finish an episode and I think to myself, yeah, we probably disappointed somebody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is one of those. Oh, yeah. There's a lot to be talked about. I'm sure that if there is somebody out there listening who studies this extinction in this time period, they're sitting there going, oh, you didn't mention this, or mm -hmm. you did. Well, this one, there's a there's a lot. Yeah. We will put lots of links in the blog post uh, in the blog post so that you can explore further if you are so inclined. This is a fascinating topic which is by no means settled but um, with almost every new research that comes out about it the pendulum just swings back and forth it just yep. as soon as they find evidence for one side evidence also comes up against or for <laughs> the opposing yes and it's it's really interesting it's truly a as you said debated and continues to be a, a uh, unclear answer yes indeed Thank you for listening to this, dear listeners. As we have officially established a tradition now, five months or so from now, we will come upon episode 35, mm -hmm. and our list of listener requests is out of extinctions. So if there is an extinction event or an extinction-related topic that you think would fit with our extinction tradition of episodes... Let us know. What's your favorite mass extinction? <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite time with lots and lots of death? <laughs> also, any other topics you'd like to hear us do uh, an episode about, let us know. We welcome your feedback, as always. Thank you. A big thank you. A big 2017-sized thank you to all of our listeners, to all of our patrons, mm -hmm. to the people who talk to us on Twitter and Facebook and who email us, to our patrons again, to the people who spread the good word yeah. of the Common Descent podcast. We see you doing it. We see you using us for your educational <laughs> endeavors, and we see you spreading our name online. We appreciate that so much. To the people who have left us reviews on iTunes and who give us stars, especially the people who give us lots of stars, we appreciate <laughs> you. This has been an incredible journey mm -hmm. through the year of 2017, and we will be back. Sincerely, everyone, it's it's been an overwhelming first year in the responses that we've gotten and that you all have given us. It's been amazing. Yes, and we look forward to more things, big things, some big things to yeah. come in 2018. Contact us. Let us know what you think. Let us know what you want to see us do. Let us know whatever you want. Ask us questions. Tell us your feelings. Reach out to us. We love hearing from you. It really is the best. Thank you to Ian. Thank mm -hmm. you to everyone who has made listener suggestions. We have them on our list. We will get to them eventually, we promise. This is the part at the end of the Marvel movies in the credits <laughs> where it's, you know, Common Descent will return. Yes, yes. <laughs> in 2018. In 2018, we will be back. Everybody in the world, have a happy new year. By the time this comes out, this will be past a lot of them, but have a happy holiday season. Mm -hmm. Have a happy winter break from school, whatever it is you're doing. 
Just just continue to be happy and all that. Continue to be happy now that you're done listening to us talk for an hour <laughs> about mass extinction yes, and yes. humans killing things. Go and... eat or drink your holiday food or beverage <laughs> of choice and watch your holiday special of choice and cheer up. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Happy New Year, everybody. We will see you next time on Common Descent. See you next year, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. For more from us, you can follow us on the Common Descent Podcast Twitter account, Facebook page, or on our WordPress blog, where we post additional cool stuff for each episode. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome. You can find this and other video game remix music at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope to see you next time.